Welcome back, scholars. I hope you're well. Um, welcome back to part two of chapter three. We're looking at sensation and perception. Uh, we spent a, a bulk and we'll spend a bulk of our time on um, vision um, and, uh, and then also hearing. Uh, and then we'll talk about the other other senses and touch and smell and taste or not smell, yeah, smell and taste, um, and 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 how we feel our way around. Um, each of the senses are extremely important. Um, we talk about uh, sight and hearing because they are uh, extremely uh, vital to how we experience the world. And you know, again, like I talked about before, um, our senses play a big role in and again how we interact with other people um, and, and just how we. Uh, like I said before, experience our, our world and, and perceive everything that we uh, that we see in our world. So we'll talk about audition and hearing, um, and then also again we'll move into uh, taste, olfactory, uh, gustatory system. We'll talk about touch, and again all of these kind of work together to give us the, the sense of uh, and the experience that we that we have. Um, you know, if you go to a concert or go to a, a baseball game or a basketball game or go to the movies, there is a uh, there's so many senses, right, that you that you're taking all of the information in. So you hear the sound, uh, the sounds, you, you smell the popcorn, um, you know, you, you walk into movie theaters are really, really cool. So you, you have that sense of uh, the temperature in the room. Uh, you might be with your favorite person. So, you know, that sense of touch and um, so, uh, you know, and then tasting the popcorn, uh, just all those things play a big role in our experiences. And so that it plays, also plays a big role in how we remember events. Uh, we remember events that are uh, extremely, you know, stimulating for, for all of our senses. We remember those things uh, a, lot, a lot better. Okay. So we'll, we'll start off with uh, hearing and getting and then move into the other, uh, the other senses, the other three. Um, so again, sound uh, like very much like um, light. Um, sound it, it travels uh, in waves, um, and, and when we talk about sound waves, uh, very very similar to um, you know light waves, where you have amplitude, you have a wavelength, and then you have what we call purity. Um, and, and and when we looked at uh, you know color, uh, the purity of the saturation of a color was um, you know the, the degree of whiteness in the color. But with purity, it is the uh, the vibrations that we hear. Um, so sound waves are produced by, again, the sound waves that travel through the air or through other mediums like water, steel, or some type of metal, um, and, other, and other substances that, uh, that are in our environment. And they travel at a speed of around 750 miles per hour, uh, which is uh, slower than sound. 750, 750 miles per hour is pretty quick, uh, but it does travel um, at, a, at the fraction of the speed of light. Um, and so that's why when we see lightning, you may see lightning outside. And then, you know, seconds later, you will hear thunder. Uh, if you ever, I don't know, this is pretty, uh, when I was in elementary school, they said when you hear lightning, or yeah, when you see lightning, rather, and you'll see the lightning and you wait and you count the number of seconds, and the number of seconds between the, the moment you see the lightning and you hear the thunder, that is like the number of minutes that the storm is away from you. Really, really cool. Uh, I didn't, I don't remember where I learned that, but I know it was sometime when I was younger, but really interesting, um, very, very interesting. So sound waves uh, are really just generated by vibrations of objects. So your vocal cords, uh, guitar strings, burst of air, me tapping on, on my desk, um, it's a vibration, and those sound waves are then released, and those waves then reach, uh, kind of serve as auditory stimuli, and when they reach our ears, there is a process that happens, and we'll talk about that process. Uh, the wavelength of um, the wave, the waves, uh, sound waves are, again, how, kind of the pitch that we hear. Uh, the longer um, the, the wavelengths, the deeper the sound, and the uh, the shorter the wavelengths, the higher the pitch, the sound, right? So really, really high pitched soprano type sounds. That's really, really uh, short wavelengths. You got the baritones. And for those who are in choir, those are those slower, lower wavelengths um, and longer wavelengths, excuse me. And then the amplitude is the loudness and how, how loud something is. And so the higher the amplitude, the 
the louder the sound is, lower the amplitude, lower the sound. Uh, and then sound is measured in decibels. We'll talk about decibels here shortly, uh, but that is the measurement for, uh, for sound. Okay, again, like we talked about, the frequency of uh, a sound wave, uh, wavelengths of sound are described in terms of hertz, right? And we talk about decibels because decibels is that measurement of amplitude and how loud or soft something is. But that frequency, uh, just like light, is measured in cycles per second. The higher the frequency, the higher the pitch, uh, similar to what I told you before. And uh, the purity of sound, again, it's that one single frequency is kind of how pure. Is, is there any mixture of different sound waves or is it just one pure sound? Um, you know, when you hear a singer uh, who has a, uh, a beautiful voice, you know, they have this sound, this, uh, this purity in their voice and their note or their pitch is really, really pure. And that timbre uh, is that uh, kind of the, uh, the fullness of the sound that we hear. Uh, the really, really big fullness of it. You know, some some artists just have a real big fullness, uh, really, really nice sound. So we like those sounds. And in our in our ears, um, we are sensitive. Um, we are sen very, very sensitive to the sounds of singing and and speech. That's kind of what our our uh, that that portion of our hearing. Um, so if the pitch is too high, the pitch is too low. Uh, those wavelengths are you know, too high or too low that we may not be able to hear, but sound uh, of someone speaking to us, uh, that is, that hits right in that sweet spot um, for human beings. Um, and so the sound of a, a typical conversation is around 60 decibels uh, as far as the amplitude. Uh, a whisper is about 30, and then the jackhammer is about 130. Um, and as we'll see on the next slide, um, the amplitude of a sound, uh, especially the Overexposure to loud sounds uh, can really be really uh, detrimental to, to the hearing um, and could damage uh, your hearing a lot faster than uh, than you the way that you'd like. Okay, so again, you know when we when we're talking about sound, and we'll, we'll listen, we'll talk to, or we'll see a few examples of different sounds that, if exposed to them over, you know, a prolonged period of time, maybe thirty plus minutes, uh, it could be very detrimental. Like you know, the loud music we play in our cars or with the headphones that we, that we have in our ears that are really, you know, on full blast, uh, we have to be really mindful of that because it is just it's sometimes some destroying some of the structures in our ears that we'll learn about shortly. Okay, uh, very very small, but but you can see, um, you know, these are extremely painful and dangerous uh, in the brown area here. Let me get my pointer. Um, but these areas here, very very dangerous. Right, fireworks, 140 decibels, gunshots. That's why it's important that you wear protective equipment. Uh, I mean, I like to go to the gun range, burn gun range sometimes, but you have to wear that protective equipment uh, because, again, these are extremely loud. And if you are uh, exposed to these for extended periods of time, it can cause permanent hearing loss, uh, jackhammers, ambulances. Uh, so, really, really important that you have um, protective uh, ear equipment, right? Earplugs you know, the head head cover, ear covers, uh, so that you're covering and, and protecting your ears. Uh, very loud, again, dangerous over 30 minutes, concerts, right? Being extremely close to the speaker for an extended amount of time, sporting events, car horns, all of these are extremely uh, dangerous. Um, you know, power tools and lawnmowers. I, I mow the grass without protective hearing equipment. I'm gonna start doing it uh, because again, uh, extended amount of time with, you know, these loud, uh, loud devices and uh, and loud machinery will, will again again hurt your ears in the long run uh our hearing already uh diminishes as we age uh, but you're just you just speed the process up and you expose yourself to uh to very loud noises over an extended period of time uh, and even these things uh it says over 85 decibels for extended periods of time can cause permanent hearing loss we just have to be very mindful of that um and uh and protect ourselves because again hearing uh, is uh, is extremely important for the way we communicate and, uh, and the way we experience uh, the world we're in. Okay. So to sense, um, you know, and to sense the you know the sound processing in, in, in our ear. Uh, again, there are neural impulses that uh, we must receive. Uh, we, we get the sound or whatever the stimulus is from our environment. The stimulus then. 
uh, passes through different channels, like in our eye, passes through our eye, through the pupil, hits the back of our retina, the retina, the light hits, and, and it is transduced and uh, transmitted uh, into the rods and the cones, and the rods and the cones then turn it into a neural impulse. That neural impulse then uh, reaches our, uh, our, you know, cortex, that visual cortex, the occipital lobe, and that's what kind of creates um, that, that vision, what we see. Uh, the same thing happens in, in all of our senses when we talk about hearing. There are some hair-like cells, and they are nerve endings that, again, create that neural impulse that then goes to our temporal lobe, uh, where we process sound, okay? But there is an external part of our ear, there's a middle part of our ear, and there's the inner ear. Uh, and these are the different structures that um, create and help to create that sound. Uh, the sound is conducted, again, by the vibrations in the air, and that goes into and is collected through the pinna. And the pinna is uh, this funnel-like piece of the ear, and it transmits the sound waves down and toward the, the eardrum, which is a, uh, it's a stretched out membrane uh, that sits on the outside of the middle ear. Um, it hits the, uh, you know, the sound waves hit the eardrum, which then press up against those three, these three uh, middle ear contains the three tiny bones with these ossicles. And as those ossicles, is a, it's a uh, kind of like a drum. And these three, these three ossicles are, are kind of working in conjunction with one another. Uh, and as that vibration is being conducted, the sound is being conducted, it moves those bones in a, a really effective way. And again, that vibration is then sent to the ossicles, and the ossicles then vibrate and send and hit against this membrane uh, on the cochlea, which we'll talk about. And it creates those neural signals that are then sent to our brain. The cochlea is this snail-like um, structure, right? And it contains uh, these cells, these nerve endings called uh, cilia or hair cells and the basal membrane on the inside of the cochlea. And it has this fluid, uh, it's coiled up, and these receptors, um, again, are moving back and forth as sound waves hit it. And that's how we experience the sound. Those nerve cells, those nerve endings then create those neural impulses. And it, the, the, nerve in, the nerve endings then send that nerve, nerve in, those neural impulse to, uh, to the ear. And so that's how we hear um, our ears uh, and then Again, it's a process that continues over and over again. And our, our brains are extremely important because they uh, lock in the different sounds, right, uh, into our memory bank. So we're very, very familiar with certain sounds, with certain voices. Our, our, our hearing is extremely selective. Uh, you know, I can kind of hear a, a voice and, and know who it is. You know, my mom calls, and even if she calls an unknown number, I can hear a voice and understand uh, who she is before before I even see who she is, right? Um, so, you know, the brain and, uh, and all these different structures help us to kind of register uh, different sounds in our uh, in our memory bank. And, and so we know what a cow sounds like, we know what a dog sounds like, um, you know, what an ambulance sounds like because of the, uh, the memories that we formed uh, through, you know, the perception of sound that we have. Okay, here are the other uh, different uh, structures again, you got the pinna, which is the outside of the ear. The eardrum is that membrane that I spoke of. And as the vibration comes in, the, the sound waves, it presses up against its eardrum, which then starts to vibrate itself. And as it moves back and forth, it kind of uh, oscillates back and forth. And as it vibrates back and forth this way, it presses up against these three structures, right? You have the, uh, uh, the hammer here, the incus, and the anvil, right? And so these all these three structures hit against this cochlea, which is the, uh, the, the snail-like structure is coiled up. On the inside of this structure, you have those hair-like cells, the cilia, and then you also have the basilar membrane on the inside, which uh, the nerve endings um, are connected to, okay? And so all of this plays a part in, again, the hearing process. Uh, when you are, um, when you think about your hearing, um, if you're exposed to uh, you know, loud, high-pitched sounds uh, with high amplitude for too long, then the the areas in your cochlea, right, those those nerve endings begin to be affected. By uh, so if you uh, listen to very, very loud music for a long period of time, it, 
it honestly, it, it can destroy uh, some of the cilia, which then um, affects your ability to hear certain sounds and hear certain pitches. Uh, and again, it just speeds that process up because as we age, our uh, the cilia in our we lose start to lose cilia gradually over over the course of time. That's why our hearing uh, begins to fade as we get older. Um, so it's important that we protect our hearing um, by making sure that we're protecting uh, you know put hearing wearing uh, having music at the right level. Um, you know, wearing protective ear equipment um, and using all those different measures to to help protect our ears and and, and how we can move forward in a, with a better quality of life with our hearing. Okay, uh, there are two theories of hearing that we uh, that, that are have been studied for forever, and uh, there are two that kind of work in conjunction when you when you kind of reconcile the two together. Uh, they work um, um, together to kind of explain how we hear. The first one is uh, what we call place theory. And on the cochlea, we have different hair cells and they're lined uh, on the, the base of the cochlea. And uh, when the sound waves uh, are then transmitted into the cochlea, it's like a, a, a grassy field. You see the grass being bent down. Those hair cells are then being bent and their hair, hair cells are kind of vibrating at a certain, certain frequency. Um, so place theory says that our perception, perception of pitch, right, perception of how High, some, how, how high something is, how high the pitch is or how low the pitch is, corresponds to different places along the basilar membrane um, inside um, the cochlea. And the higher the pitch, the, the closer it is to the entrance of that, the basilar membrane of the cochlea. And the lower the pitch, it travels a little bit further down, um, down into the spiral there. Uh, so the waves kind of, the wave peaks depend on the frequency and, uh, and the frequency of the sound wave. And so I'll, I'll kind of go back. So if you go back here, the higher the pitch, uh, you have hair cells that are aligned all through uh, the structure, right? All the way through to the end. And so the higher the pitch, um, when we talk about place theory, these hair cells are responding at a, at a higher frequency. And so they can, can do conducting the, uh, the neural impulse. And as the pitch gets lower and lower, then the, the lower the pitch, these hair cells have been activated down here at the end of the cochlea. So again, depending on the pitch, depends on where uh, those hair cells are being stimulated. Okay? The other one is the frequency theory. And so the frequency theory says that the, 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 the perception of the pitch corresponds to the frequency and the entire basilar membrane is vibrating, not just the individual cells, but as we have learned, the entire basilar membrane does vibrate and each pitch does again attract and hit a different place in the, the cochlea and the, those hair cells. And so they kind of work together and depends on kind of both place and the frequency coding of vibrations along the basilar membrane to again process um, our sound. Uh, one of the other things that happens again, just like with our eyes, we're able to um, see how far something is away or how close something is away because of the binocular cues on the binocular vision and it's more difficult when we only have uh, we're only using one eye um, the same thing happens with our ears uh, when we have uh, ears two ears on, on each side of our head they're about six inches apart and it allows us to locate sounds in our environment um, so if i hear something on my right hand side the sound is going to hit my right ear before it hits my left ear. And so it's going to be louder on this side. And so I'll turn to the right to notice that something's on, on the right hand side. The same is with uh, something on the left hand side. And that's how we are able to locate. When we talk about auditory localization, it reaches the ear sooner. And so we turn to the place where it's a little louder and we know where it hit the ear sooner. Okay, It says when sound reaches the right ear, uh, sound is less intense because it traveled a greater distance. Okay, so again, we can we can sense that with our brains, um, and those cues help us to kind of understand where we are and localize things and sounds in place. It's a lot harder when things are either above or beneath us, right? Um, because again, if it's above and beneath, it's really it's really difficult to uh, to understand where it's coming from. So you have to kind of, or even behind and in the front, you're kind of figuring out like where where. Where is the sound coming from? Like, you ever been in the car and you hear the uh, the sirens from 
uh, the uh, the ambulance, right? And you're like, is it coming? You're looking, and it's, you know, can't you can't really see, um, you know, and it might it sounds like it's maybe uh, up in front of you, or coming from the left, uh, and then as it comes closer, then you're able to kind of localize it because uh, it's coming a lot closer. But sometimes it's difficult to localize when things are behind you, in front of you, or under or uh, above you. Okay. So it says, in which part of the ear do the vibrations of the eardrum transmit inward by a chain of three tiny bones, the hammer, anvil, and the stir? And if you were, uh, obviously, the external ear, um, we learned about that's the pinna, and we learned about the, uh, the inner ear, which was the uh, cochlea. Uh, so uh, you should have selected uh, middle ear. The middle ear uh, has, the, again, the vibration of the eardrum which transmits inward by the mechanical chain of those tiny bones, those ossicles, the hammer, the hand, and the and the stir. Okay. So now we're going to talk about with the rest of our five senses or the three senses, and, and we're going to taste, smell, and touch. And each of these extremely important taste and smell go together um, because without smell, uh, it's very, very difficult to taste. And, uh, and so we, we need both, and, and we'll, I'll, I'll show you a diagram um, at the end. You'll see kind of where uh, in the brain these the taste and smell are processed in the brain. They're in kind of very similar regions and near the temporal lobe. And so that's no, it's no wonder why uh, taste and smell kind of go together and how we experience, uh, especially taste. Okay. So when we talk about the gustatory system, um, Gustation is uh, taste, uh, taste buds, right? That's the, the the biggest thing that we've learned about um, my taste buds. Uh, you know, those clusters of taste cells that kind of found on the on the base of the tongue and around the trenches of the tongue. Those are those tiny bumps um, on the tongue. And adults have around between two thousand and ten thousand taste buds. And depending on you know, some people taste foods better than others. You know, food critics likely have more taste buds than those who are not and can distinguish between, uh, you know, various different flavors and tastes uh, more than, you know, they're, they're called more super tasters uh, than non-tasters who have fewer taste buds. But what happens, again, each bud, um, each taste bud contains about 50 to 100 taste receptors. And as we chew um, substances, uh, maybe we're chewing our, our favorite candy, um, the candy and the saliva is dissolving um, the, the the sugar, and what we're tasting is the sweetness. But the uh, the chemical is then getting into our taste bud, and the taste bud is sending a neural impulse, right? Uh, sending a neural impulse. Um, you know, those nerve endings are then transmitting the information to our brain, uh, and then the brain is telling us what we're tasting because of those different receptors in our tongue. Uh, taste cells and uh, our taste buds kind of. Uh, they last for about five, five to ten days, and uh, each, you know, each they, they they die off and then they 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 regenerate, right? Uh, and about two thirds of the taste buds are located on the tongue, and as you see on the diagram here, uh, at the base, the back of the tongue, they're on the, the kind of the sides of the tongue, and then you have them on the tip of the tongue, and you know, uh, you're able to taste things based on. Um, you know, those taste buds. I mean, again, the, the chemicals are then released uh, and are dissolved, and then the, the receptors uh, then create that neural impulse that we talk about, okay? Uh, uh, the other remaining taste buds, are, you know, found in the soft palate in the back of the throat, um, the epiglottis and the upper esophagus in the back of the throat there, and, uh, and so those also serve as op you know, opportunities. So if you miss your, you know, maybe swallow something and you're still able to kind of taste a little bit of it, not as, not as probably not as good, uh, but you're still able to taste even with without having to without chewing some things, right? So again, that is the taste, right? And so we'll talk about smell and flavor here shortly. But again, that's one of the reasons why we are able to taste is again dissolving the liquid. The liquid is then um, dissolved and then hits those nerve end, those nerve endings and taste buds and gives us uh, gives us the, the sense of taste. Um, there are four primary tastes. Um, you have sweet, sour, bitter, and salty. Uh, and then you have an additional one, uh, umami, which is kind of a savory taste, kind of given um, by the, the taste of meat, uh, meat, uh, you know, soy, 
you know, that meaty flavor. And, uh, and then there are some other tastes that haven't been agreed upon yet, like uh, fat, having a fatty taste. Uh, but again, they're still being researched and researchers reveal that, you know, we, we, we have various um, receptors in our, in, our, in our, you know, taste buds. And those receptors have various uh, specialties in tasting sour, sweet, bitter, and salty. And, and then they have also being able to taste umami, which is uh, savory. Uh, again, like we talked about before, there are people who have more sensitivity to taste. When we're younger, uh, our sensitivity to taste is uh, really, really high. That's why children are a lot more picky in their eating habits, right? They like the more the tastier foods. Or, or what they think to be the taste of your foods. And as we get older, um, our taste buds uh, and our, our sensitivity to taste starts to decline. Um, so that's why, you know, as we get older, uh, we, we like to call it an acquired taste. But oftentimes it's just because our taste buds are we're not as sensitive as they were when we were younger. And so we're, we're able to eat things that we might have not have been able to eat uh, as a child, right? Because we were so picky as, as, uh, as children. Um, but again, non-tasters tend to have about one fourth uh, of the, the taste buds uh, per per square centimeter than, than super tasters. Super tasters again have more taste buds. Non-tasters, you know, they're, they're they're struggling, right? That's why you have some people who, you know, you you, you eat the same food and you're like, man, this is disgusting, and they're like, it's not too bad, right? Maybe it's uh, their taste buds. Um, you may you may have a sensitive, sensitive more sensitive palate uh, than they do. Um, we talked about uh, adaptation, light and dark adaptation for the eye, but you also have, uh, you know, a taste adaptation, right? You're tasting something really, really sweet, and it eventually fades away and gradually declines in the sensitivity after kind of prolonged stimulation to it. Uh, and then it might be that the saliva in our mouths dilute some of the flavor as well, or the taste of it, um, so we may not, you know, taste it in the same intensity as as we once did. Um, and then we sometimes get flavor and taste uh, mixed up. They're not the same. Um, flavor is a kind of a combination of a number of things. Um, so we're able to taste things without, um, you know, the flavor of things. Or we might be able to taste that something is sweet, but we, we can't taste the flavor of it, right? Uh, so taste, the odor, and the chemical sensations that we have, those what are what combine to create the flavor that we have. And if something is extremely flavorful, it smells really, really good. It has a great texture and it tastes amazing, right? Um, and smell is one of the major contributors to uh, flavor. If you can't smell, if you ever uh, close your nose and tasted something or try to taste something, like when you're, say when you're sick, uh, you, you lose your sense of smell for a while and, and you try to eat something and all you taste is saltiness or sweetness, right? You can't taste the flavor of it. Um, that's what happens. Um, you lose the sense of smell. It's the main contributor to flavor. Uh, so again, I know when we had COVID, that was one of the biggest things. People were losing their taste uh, and their smell. And um, people, I mean, you take it for granted, but it's extremely important for our uh, for our sensations and our perception of what we're what we're experiencing. Okay. Um, one of the other things that we talk about, um, you know, there's a, a kind of a cranial nerve uh, that carries signals from our, you know, through through the brain to the brain through the thalamus. Uh, to the frontal lobe to give us the perception, right, of what we're what we're tasting, um, and these fibers help to send those signals. Uh, and our frontal lobe allows us to kind of know and distinguish, uh, you know, one taste from the other, right? So, you know, that cross fiber pattern model um, just you know kind of suggests that uh, there's no nerve fibers are kind of responsible for information from several tastes, not just one taste, right? So they're that, you know, you have different specialties for neurons, just like uh, what we talked about with uh, the, the rods and the cones, different structures, um, and then different specializations and feature detectors and vision. Uh, so it's, it's no uh, no surprise that even in in taste, there are specialized nerve fibers and uh, neurons that are activated uh, from different tastes, uh, like sweet, salty, and bitter. Uh, smell is the other one, right? One of the, the again, one of the major con the contributors to taste. Uh, and again, they are kind of uh, very, very, they're, they're close in where they are um, uh, in the brain, where they're, they're operating in the brain um, near the temporal lobe um, where you hear. Uh, so again, the sensory kind of resembles the sense of taste in many, many ways. Uh, it has those 
uh, those nerve cells that um, they're their taste buds in our in our, in our mouth, mouth and the tongue. And then you have those our olfactory nerves, which are then stimulated by uh, chemicals, right? So the physical stimuli uh, are chemical substances that are kind of dissolved uh, in the air, um, in our mucus, in our nose. And those olfactory cilia, then, um, you know, those nasal passages, those are the receptors that take on that chemical and allow us to know what we're smelling. So those, those axons then send the information. Uh, you know, that synapse the cells to the olfactory bulb, and then that allows us to, uh, you know, go to the olfactory cortex and the temporal lobe, and then that's how we understand what we're smelling. Uh, again, this is the only sensory system that is not routed through the thalamus uh, before it projects onto the cortex. So it goes directly to the cortex. Um, and, uh, you know, that, again, it we might be able to understand why maybe we smell something very, very quickly. So maybe it's a... Um, you know, it's a defense mechanism, right, for survival. Um, when you're asleep, you you wake up because you smell something, right? Um, and so it, it, it's not really processed as quickly, but you smell it, you wake up, and uh, and then you, you get to action, right? So, again, it's the only one that's not. So just something to remember. So all the other senses, the, the, the eye, you know, vision, hearing, um, touch, taste, all of that is, is kind of processed through the thalamus. The thalamus then kind of reroutes it to uh, the, the cortex is responsible for uh, that stimulus. And then we are able to, uh, to get that perception. Okay. So perceiving odor. Um, <laughs> this is a fun picture. I remember uh, when, we, when we first put on the mask for COVID, um, I didn't realize like if you, if Many people realize how um, how bad their breath may be if they don't brush their teeth well enough, right? You, you you do something like that, but with the mask on, it's doing that naturally. You breathe, and you're like, "Oh man, I need to, I need to go, I need to go brush my teeth," right? Uh, but the odor, right? The odor, uh, those olfactory uh, detects those molecules of those odorants, and uh, if they're kind of sufficiently kind of uh, concentrated, they stimulate the receptors. And that's how we get that, that kind of sense of what we're smelling, you know, smelling uh, cookies or smelling pizza. You know, there's a, a concentration of those odors and that kind of stimulates certain receptors. Uh, and we have approximately 1000 types of odor receptors. Right. Um, and so very, very specialized to different odors. And there's a combination um, of different chemical, different odors that uh are like lock and key, similar to what we saw in the neurotransmitters where one particular neurotransmitter had a particular receptor site and it was like a lock and a key. Um, that receptor site only received a particular neurotransmitter. The same thing with odors. There are certain odor mo molecules that are specialized for these different receptor cells and they only match to those receptor cells, those specialized receptor cells. Um, you know, and again, we recognize them and we respond by signaling those neural signals to the brain uh, that gives us those perceptions of different odors that we smell. So when we smell some something that, you know, doesn't smell so pleasant, again, there are different molecules being released and we register, register that. And it's really important because, um, you know, smelling something is a way that we uh, understand that maybe, maybe are we in danger or are we not? And it helps us to understand, you know, if, if we smell something that's not not good, um, then we, you know, especially when we're eating something, we're not going to we're not going to eat anything that smells sour, right? Or or something that doesn't smell that good. Um, and it's a way that we help. It helps to to as a survival mechanism. Um, so you know, taste and smell go hand in hand um, as as we use them to kind of protect ourselves and, uh, and and again, like you said, survive. Um, again, being able to identify and discriminate odors, um, you know, you're able to kind of get the source, the distance, and the area of all kind of the effect of the concentration of odors, right? So if you got barbecue, barbecue is a very, very strong smell, right? Uh, so you can kind of know where it is and if the, the wind is blowing, it, it, you can smell barbecue from miles away. Um, so again, the odor and the concentration of odor plays a big role. If somebody sprays perfume in a, in a really, really closed room, a really, really tight room, really, really strong intensity, um, or you spray it, you know, in a in a basketball gym, it might not be as concentrated. It's not as concentrated then, so you don't smell the the intensity of it. Um, 
but again, there has to be some context oftentimes to be able to smell things and identify them. Um, so when you don't have context, sometimes it's really difficult uh, to kind of get the idea of what it is. There are some distinct smells um, like pizza. I can smell pizza. I kind of know what pizza smells like. Um, you know, there's certain perfumes. You kind of know what that, what that smell is like. Um, and you smells have a kind of a memory component, right? You smell certain things and it kind of takes you back kind of nostalgia. Um, but again, there, there is training and, you know, you sometimes you need experience to affect the detection of certain smells. Um, certain, certain smells are, are second nature to people because they've been around it for so long. And, um, you know, you train your, your, your nose to kind of smell those things. Uh, women do tend to uh, have more acute sense of smell than men do. And, uh, and, you know, you, you walk in uh, from playing outside when you were younger, your mom's like, oh, you should be outside. You need, to, you need to go take a shower, right? But, uh, and again, with with the sense of smell, um, we have what we call sensory adaptation. Uh, so you can walk into a room, uh, originally you smell it, and then the, the sense of smell uh, it doesn't fade, it, you just adapt to it. So your, your neural system, your neural impulses no longer uh, unless you smell a, a different smell, but you do adapt. Many our senses do adapt uh, to to the environment. If we did not adapt to the environment, um, you know, if our senses didn't adapt, then our brains would be in overload. Um, we'd be trying to understand, and and be our brains would be wired to kind of just continually continually be in motion um, because we we'd be experiencing things for the first time each time. Um, but like I talked about before, just like sight and, um, and hearing, uh, the sense of smell peaks at and around early adulthood, uh, and then it begins to slowly decline. And so, again, that also plays into taste. We talked about uh, we might begin to taste things and, and try things when we're, as we're older because the smell um, isn't as bad as it was when we were younger. Um, and again, when you get older, you know, smell, sight, hearing all become diminished. Um, you know, and uh, so again, protecting your hearing, your smell, uh, your touch, uh, your sense of everything needs to be protected. So uh, you make sure that it doesn't, you know, speed up the process and, and the diminishing of uh, some of these uh, these activities that we have. Um, aging, like we talked about, smoking is another one um, that can diminish the uh, the performance of you know kind of the olfactory. Um, so it's important that we take that into account. Age is already going to kind of decline uh, kind of our, our ability to kind of smell. Um, as you see this chart here, uh, there is a, you know, this is the ability to identify common odorants declines from 20 all the way down to 70, right? So we have to be really mindful of what we're doing um, and how we take care of our body. Um, because again, uh, smoking or inhaling things, or snorting things uh, can affect um, your, your sense of smell and, you know, we take it for granted, but smelling and being able to smell is, I mean, it's a blessing, um, to be able to smell. Like I said, when we were, you know, had COVID and we were able to, unable to taste and smell, you know, it, it, uh, it really threw some people off. Right. Um, so again, we, we take it for granted, but, uh, you know, just be mindful of how we're taking care of ourselves and, and what, what activities we're participating in that might negatively influence, uh, our quality of life in the long run. All right, so one of the other things that we talk about with touch, right? Touch is uh, one of the biggest, you know, talk about our skin, you know, skin is, is, is how we experience touch, the temperature, other different senses. Uh, one of the, it's the largest organ in our body. Uh, one of the most important protects our, our organs and the interior of our body. Um, and, uh, you know, touch, people think it's just one, one particular, uh, sense but there are so many i mean there's temperature there's touch there's pain uh, there's shape perception there's uh, propio you know proprioception uh, body imbalance of the vestibular system you know all of those things are really really important and they work together to give us you know really what we need right um, to function in the world if if we did not experience touch right uh, even the touch with you know our mom do we use touch in a way for uh, intimacy and, and closeness and warmth and, 
and, and to get, you know, to get close to somebody and to be able to touch them, you know, to hug them. And, um, you know, that's why one of the love languages is uh, physical touch, because touch is such a powerful means to connect with people. And we connect based on the touching. You know, we can speak and communicate, but touching is really, really important. But again, uh, all of these different senses, um, you know, our, our, our sense of touch comes into these. I mean, this is kind of a collection of these. And, uh, you know, we'll talk about them in, in detail here next. Just like with all of our other senses, there, there are cells and there are receptors that allow us to uh, send messages to our brain. Um, the somatosensory, uh, somatosensory, excuse me, uh, cortex, which is kind of devoted and, and dedicated to processing the signals that come from our fingers, our lips, our tongue, our skin, uh, and it allows us to touch, to, to experience the touch, right? So we were able to, to know that, you know, I'm touching my hand right now because I have uh, sensors on, on the outside of my, on my skin. You know, I got hot receptors, I got, you know, the pain receptors, touch receptors, the, the vibration, the pressure, uh, so I'm able to feel pressure. Um, you know, something's pressing down on my skin, I'm able to feel that, and they're sending a message to my uh, somatosensory cortex to allow me to know where that pressure, where that heat, uh, you know, where the, where the touch is coming from, okay? But again, that physical stimuli is kind of a mechanical thermal thing, uh, and then it sends that chemical energy that comes into the contact with the skin. So, you know, if, if wetness, you know, there's a combination of, um, um, you know, hitting at different combination of different receptors at one time. Um, but the cells in the nervous system respond and are very, very sensitive to different, you know, specific patches of skin. Um, you know, some areas of our body are more sensitive than others because they have more uh, receptor cells there than others. Um, and then those nerve fibers then take that incoming information and then they route it, you know, the pathway the two ways, right? It goes to the thalamus. Uh, and then the somatosensory cortex and the parietal lobe, like we talked about. Uh, and so it's really important, um, you know, when you get burned, that's, again, our touch. It helps to protect us. If I, if I feel something that's really, really hot, I remove that. Um, and people who, who do not do not have a sense of touch, right, if you don't have, you know, the pain receptors uh, and you, you're, you get stabbed and you're bleeding, right, and you can't, you can't see that you're in pain, then you, it can be detrimental to your quality of life. So again, it's really important. Um, and this, you know, these senses are extremely important for, for our well-being in the long run. But, you know, the four basic, I can talk about pressure, hot, cold, pain, all of them have different uh, receptors that are specialized to experience different parts. Okay. Um, again, this, we talked about the different areas of our body and how how sensitive they are. Um, we look at the threshold and we talk about a spatial resolution. There is a two point threshold where uh, the two point threshold is the smallest distance um, between two points where it feels like I have two stimulus versus one, right? So in particular areas of our body, on our tongue, we can feel, you know, we can feel two points at 1.1 nanometers, right? On our, um, on our finger, three to eight nanometers. And as we go to areas that are a little less sensitive, right? So if I go to my back, the threshold, it, it gets a little, and this is millimeters, excuse me, uh, back is, is a little less sensitive. The thighs are a little less sensitive. But as you go to your fingers, you see how the sensitivity, that sensitivity is extremely high, right? Uh, the palm is not that sensitive, the forearm is that sensitive, uh, the calf is that sensitive, but there are other places, again, that are more sensitive than, um, than others, right? And so the shorter this list, the, that's the shorter that threshold, right? So I can, feel, I can feel two points. If I put two points here and as I spread it out, you can definitely feel it. But as you get closer and closer and closer, you can still feel the two points, right? If you go to your forearm, I can't really feel two points here. Right. As I spread out, it takes a little bit. Now I can feel two points there. But as I go closer and closer, I only feel one. So you do that on your own. Right. But you can tell um, based on the this, this receptors in our skin, um, how sensitive because we have different amounts of receptors in different parts of our body. On different parts of our body. Excuse me. Okay. 
Uh, one other thing that is really, really important, again, like we talked about pain, um, it's definitely a crucial warning system uh, for survival. Uh, same with taste and smell. Uh, they are they're also um, very crucial for survival. You know, eating the right things. You don't want anything that's poisonous. Uh, you don't want anything that's, uh, that's bad. Um, but the receptors for pain, again, are mostly free uh, nerve endings in the skin. And, you know, they allow us to understand, Ken, what, what's happening in our in our system if i'm being hit or if i'm being stabbed if i'm being cut uh, it allows me to kind of know locally where kind of localize where that is um excuse me and so it's really important that we have these systems work optimally because again really really important um, a great number of our infections uh, and our injuries happen when there are no warnings of pain uh, especially with individuals who might have diabetes or they have reduced uh, sensitivity to neuropathies in their extremities. You know, maybe they have a, a cut on their foot and they don't, they can't really feel. They have numbness in their feet. Uh, and that's why sometimes they have to be, their feet have to be amputated because they get infections in their feet. Uh, maybe they have sores or open wounds on their feet, um, which causes, you know, causes infection. They get infected and then they have to be amputated. So, um, again, taking care of your body is extremely important. So we, we preach, you know, just really, uh, being cognizant of how you eat, um, you know, how you clean yourself, just taking great care of your skin, uh, really, really important because protecting your skin, uh, is, again, is protecting one of the, the, the largest organs in your body. Um, your pain perception is uh, pretty subjective, though, right? Uh, you know, some people have higher tolerances for pain. Uh, culturally, some people have, you know, higher tolerances for pain from, from wherever wherever they're from. Um, and uh, one of the one of the different theories for pain uh, is called the gate control theory. And this theory uh, is kind of proposes that pain uh, kind of has an operation uh, between two types of nerve fibers in your spinal cord. And there's a gate. It's not that, not a, a, a physical gate, right? But there, there are different nerves in our spinal cord that send messages from our body, uh, from our extremities to our brain. And there are smaller nerve fibers in those two types of fibers that carry information to our to our brain, right? And the, 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 there are larger nerve fibers that, when stimulated, then uh, kind of mediate or kind of block the pain. That's why when you know somebody slaps you on your arm and you just rub your arm, the the, the pain kind of diminishes uh, because the um, the larger nerve fibers are being stimulated and they block uh, the pain uh, that is kind of radiated and experienced by those smaller nerve fibers. Uh, and so it's important, again, to know kind of the processes. Again, you, you stub your toe and you reach down and start rubbing your toe. And that sometimes diminishes the pain uh, that you experience because of those nerve fibers that are being stimulated. Okay. Um, but again, the gait, uh, like I said before, is uh, it, it's not an anatomical, anatomical structure, but it's just a pattern of kind of neural activity uh, that kind of inhibits the incoming pain signals that come in uh, kind of through our through our extremities into our uh, spinal cord and, and into our brain, tell us what's happening. Um, one of the other things that we talk about is there are neural, um, you know, mechanisms that appear to block the perception of pain. Um, we talk about the uh, uh, the gate control theory, endorphins. Obviously, we talk about um, the neurotransmitters or those hormones that are released when you experience pain. Uh, those do block. They're kind of a natural pain reliever. Um, you know, there's a neural pathway that kind of mediates the suppression of pain. Um, and there are certain types of glia cells that also may contribute to the regulation of pain. So there are certain mechanisms in, you know, the, in our neural activity that help to kind of mitigate and block pain uh, in our system. So, you know, just be, be mindful of that. But again, uh, that's why it's always important to understand uh, functioning of the body, right? Knowing that uh, we have uh, endorphins that are being released when we're experiencing pain um, helps, you know, that's why we're able to kind of get through uh, certain things because endorphins are being released. Uh, and then there are some biological influences of pain. We have psychological influences, and then I'll, I'll discuss some social culture influences of pain. That'll be it for, uh, uh, for this chapter. So the biological influences of pain, um, you know, there are different influences, but, you know, pain is not just triggered by uh, any one type of stimulus. 
Uh, they're very, they vary. Um, you have heat, you got pressure, pain. Uh, there's so many different triggers uh, that we have. You can get somebody to pinch you and that's pressure, right? Um, and the brain sometimes misinterprets pain, you know? Uh, I don't know if you've ever bumped into something and thought it might hurt. So you say, ouch, and it doesn't even hurt, right? Our brain is just, it has this expectation, right? That is pain, right? That's kind of the psychological, but again, the biological sometimes plays tricks on us as well. And we misinterpret it as well. Um, so if you kind of rub this pressure, but it's also creating heat, right? So there's a combination um, and again, triggered by not, again, multiple, multiple stimuli. Um, when we talk about the psychological influences, attention uh, focused on pain is powerful influence on our perception of pain. So if we're, if we get hit and we start staring at it, we might feel it a lot more psychologically looking at it. We know it's, we know it's a cut, we know it's hurting. And as we look at it, uh, it, it kind of gives us the impression that, man, it's, it's, it's hurting so bad. Um, we oftentimes feel less pain um, when we're distracted um, or um, when we're, you know, maybe by humor or by maybe some challenging activity. That's why when uh, when athletes are in the heat of, you know, competition, you know, they might be getting hit, and hurt. Maybe they sprain their ankle, but they keep going because, uh, they're distracted by, you know, the goal, whatever they're doing there, they're kind of distracted by it. And it's only un until after the game. I know when I was playing football, um, I would get hit and I'd have scratches and cuts and uh, bumps and, and I'd get in the shower and I'm feeling all these burns and, man, I heard, and then I wake up the next morning and it feels like you've been hit by a truck, right? It's, it's so painful, but during the activity, man, you can't feel any pain. Um, humor, you know, you're, if you're laughing and you have humor, man, it, sometimes that mitigates the pain as well. Um, again, we we all have different have ex, different have, have different expectations of pain. And that's why it's important sometimes where uh, you're going in for shots, and the doctor will say this won't hurt a bit. And that just that statement alone, we know it's going to be painful. But him saying that it won't hurt a bit, and then they give the injection, it, it doesn't hurt as bad as if. We're thinking, oh, it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt, it's going to hurt. And then they, they, they prick us and it's, it, it does have a little more pain, right? We, if we were to do a, uh, uh, a survey and uh, to rate the pain, we probably rate it a little higher if we were focusing on it with the expectation that it's going to hurt versus an expectation that it's not going to hurt. And so, you know, other, other areas like kind of like social cultural, we we'll talk about again, um, again, our attention, our expectations and our culture play a big role. Um, you know, culturally in other cultures, uh, they, you know, they get piercings, they pierce themselves without, you know, uh, and, and they don't seem to, to really experience pain. You know, other cultures, uh, you know, other African cultures, you know, they have, they have a, a different threshold of pain than, than we do. Um, and it's really based on how they how they were raised and how they grew up uh, and then how they perceive and how they kind of experience pain uh, and just life generally. Uh, but again, then the second thing, kind of the social stuff is, you know, humans feel more pain uh, when others seem to be experiencing pain. Do you, you ever been getting a whooping? Um, you've been watching. I, I had cousins and uh, we'd, be, we'd be in trouble and you know, our cousin's getting a whipping and he's crying. We're like, oh, man, it's going to suck. <laughs> right. And then it comes our time. and It hurts. Um, you know, that, that happens. You know, we we experience things uh, that others do through a form of empathy. Um, and, uh, you know, humans are, are really complicated beings and really psychological beings. Uh, so we do have a biological and a physiological side, but we also have a psychological side. And our brains are really, really important and can can really uh, influence our experience. Um, so we have to be mindful of what we, what we think, uh, how we think, because um, it does mitigate uh, the experiences and the sensations we experience in, in, our, in our work. Um, here are just some of the uh, kind of a summary of what we talked about today, uh, you know, for chapter four, uh, you know, sensation and perception, sight, these these five senses really, really important for us. Uh, we spend a lot of time on sight and hearing because, again, those are very, very critical, um, you know, but taste, smell and touch. Uh, all, all I continue to, to think, especially during sensation and perception chapters, you know, don't take these for granted. You know, these are really, really important for uh, our well-being and our, our quality of life. And, and without one of them, uh, it impacts the others, right? So 
just be just be mindful of that, um, you know, and, and study, you know, study these, know the structures. Uh, and again, with all of these, there is an impulse, right? A neural impulse. Uh, there are nerve endings in each of these, uh, the retina, uh, you have the, uh, the hair cells in the cochlea, uh, you have the taste receptors in the taste buds, you have the olfactory cilia in the, in the nose, right, in the olfactory bulb. And then again, in touch, you have those nerve endings. You have the, the touch. You got pressure. You got heat. You got uh, all of those different uh, nerve endings and cells. And so those send those in those neural impulses through those structures to our brain, our brains, these different structures in our brains, the occipital lobe, uh, the primary auditory cortical of the temporal lobe here, uh, also located in the visual temporal lobe, primary taste cortex, temporal lobe. This is in the lower part of the temporal lobe right there. Um, and then you have the bridal lobe um, here, the primary, somo, the primary somo, the somatic sensory cortex. So again, different areas of the brain are responsible um, for uh, different sight, touch, and all of our different senses. And then finally, here's the, the diagram. Again, you see touch, taste, uh, smell, and taste are very, very close together. That's why uh, they they work kind of con in conjunction to one another because uh, they're located in similar parts of the brain. So uh, just be mindful of that. Um, and uh, this is chapter four, uh, taste and, and perception. I mean, sens sens sensation and perception, excuse me. Uh, that's a Freudian slip. If you remember Sigmund Freud, I was thinking uh, taste. I was reading taste on the screen here and uh, that slipped out. But I uh, hope you all having a great one. And uh, thank you for watching. We'll see you all later.